Hello, everyone. I hope you're all healthy, safe, and well. Thank you for joining us for the third talk of our Golden Week of Webinars in Astrophysics series. My name is Thomas Puzia. I'm a faculty member at the Institute of Astrophysics of Pontificia Universidad Católica in Santiago de Chile and the head of the outreach at the Institute. And together with Evelyn Johnston, one of our postdoctoral fellows, we have organized this week for you. We're very excited to bring you talks from scientists who have significantly contributed to astronomy, astrophysics, and cosmology, and thereby expanded our understanding of the nature and inner workings of the universe. It will be hopefully an exciting and instructive journey for you as we move from the largest scales of the universe, over structure and galaxy formation, to the formation of planets and the fabric of reality itself during this series of webinars. We're looking forward to bringing you these talks in the original English language with simultaneous Spanish translation to your screens without any registration fees. This has been made possible by the generous support of the Vice Rectorate for Investigation of our University and the Center for Astrophysics and Related Technologies, also known as CATA for its Spanish acronym. Our third talk this week will be given by Professor Sandy Faber, who is a professor emeritus at the University of California at Santa Cruz, and an astronomer at the University of California Observatories. But we will first give a brief introduction of how the webinar will run today. I'm sure many of you already know the drill. We are looking forward to it bringing you these talks in two languages. For this talk series, we have organized a simultaneous language translation uh, provided by Mr. Patricio Gonzalez, director of Serendipia Soluciones, who will be simultaneously translating for us in both English to Spanish and Spanish to English directions. On your devices, you can switch between English and Spanish channels using the language button at the bottom of your Zoom window. We discovered that the live interpretation option is not offered for people using Zoom in the browser or on Linux machines. We apologize for this and we will post both the English and the Spanish versions of the talk on the Astrophysica UC YouTube channel soon. We've also heard from a few participants that they could not mute the original soundtrack when listening to the Spanish translation. This appears to be a bug in Zoom, and we've been told that by leaving and rejoining the webinar should fix the issue. If you do have any questions during the talk, please type them into the Q&A window. To open this window, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom page. All viewers uh, will be able to upvote and downvote questions and comment on them. We have a team of astronomers and journalists behind the scenes who will be monitoring your questions and will select the best questions for the discussion after the talk. The talk is expected to last for around 45 minutes and we'll have time for questions at the end. The questions from the audience will be selected from the Q&A window only. Before we begin, I would also like to briefly introduce the other panel members that are with us today. So we have from the faculty of the Institute of Astrophysics, my colleagues, Gaspar Gallas, Ezequiel Treister, Franz Bauer, Nelson Padilla, and Felipe Barrientos. We also have the postdocs, Giuseppe Diago and Paul Eigenthaler with us, and the graduate students, Alvaro Valenzuela, Cristobal Moya, Simon Angel, and Ernesto Camacho. We're also very honored to have special guests with us, Brian Miller, who is an astronomer at the Gemini Observatory, Boris Heusler, who is an astronomer at the European Southern Observatory, Mara Mobasher, who is a professor of astronomy at the University of California at Riverside, Gustavo Buzuay, who is a faculty at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, and Marcin Savitsky, who is a professor of astronomy at St. Mary's University. Also together with us is the team of our QA and Q&A managers who will be working in the background, sifting through all the questions and messages from you, who are Daniela Fernandez, Carlos Rojas, and Ricardo Acevedo. Before we begin with Sandy's introduction, however, I would like to ask Gaspar to say a few words. You have to switch on your microphone, Gaspar. <laughs> thank you, Thomas. Well, this, this happened. Huh? So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for connecting to this webinar today. Just a few words regarding the global situation. In the middle of the pandemics, many injustices arise as urgent to be corrected. At, at the Institute uh, of Astrophysics, we want to a fair world where no discrimination of race, gender, color, religion, sexual orientation, or physical handicap prevails. This is just a statement that is, I think is important in these days. 
So now it's a pleasure to open this third day of webinar in astrophysics and welcome Professor Sandra Faber, more well known as Sandy Faber, one of the most prominent astronomers in the study of stellar populations. She was a pioneer in the study of stellar properties in galaxies, providing many tools to understand the past and the evolution of them in the universe. Sandy contributed in fundamental aspects in the study of galaxy properties, showing how, for example, the evolution of galaxies determines the properties, the photometric properties and kinematics inside clusters and in the field. She is very well known after the so-called Faber-Jackson relation. All of us study that in astronomy. Or the relationship between the central velocity dispersion of stars in elliptical galaxies and the luminosity, providing a robust and powerful secondary distance indicator capable to be used up to large distances. Also, Sandy was part of a very inspiring group of extragalactic astronomers in the 80s, known as the Seven Samurai. Very interesting exercise of international collaboration in astronomy at a time when such a collaboration was not as obvious as we see today. Sandy, for us at the Institute of Astrophysica Catolica, is a real privilege to have you as speaker in this webinar and are very happy to share your talk with thousands of attendees. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Gaspar, and thanks to the whole team. Uh, I normally thank my audience for coming. I've never had to thank over 2,000 people before. This is really a first, and you folks at the university, I think, have captured the imagination of astronomers and shown us a new way into a new world. So. I'm really enjoying this and, and it's an experiment for me, I'm sure, as much as it is for you. I'm going to share my screen now uh, and switch over to my presentation. And I'm not seeing a share screen allowed here. There we go. Here we are. Switching over. Very good. Okay. So my talk is entitled Galaxy Formation and Evolution, What Seems Simple and What Remains Outstanding. And it could have a subtitle called uh, Reverse Engineering Galaxy Evolution. That's my second screen here, which of course we, we practiced this five times and now it's not working. Um, perhaps I should stop share and try once more. Okay, uh, where did my Zoom go? Try sharing screen again. And advance this way. There we are. The subtitle is Reverse Engineering Galaxy Evolution because this is an attempt to work backwards directly from the uh, the observations in order to reach some conclusions, new conclusions about um, galaxy quenching in particular, but also some conclusions about galaxies during the star forming phase. And I want to start by acknowledging all the people I've worked with over the last several decades. Every one of these people have contributed to the ideas that I'm going to share with you today. And in particular, my talk today is a summary of the main points from this paper, which has recently been accepted for publication in the APJ. And the chief author of this paper is Chu Chen, who is a wonderful Chinese astronomer from Shanghai Normal University. Without further ado, let me plunge in. This is a bit of an introduction. I'm taking you back to the 1950s, when astronomers were beginning to study stellar evolution using diagrams like this, the HR diagram. It had been known for several decades before this, and when first discovered, people thought that it might be a cooling sequence, in that stars started out bright and hot and gradually cooled off and moved down along the, the main sequence. But um, further thought indicated, no, the timescales just didn't work out for that. Eddington and others looked into an energy source, and that led to the discovery of nucleosynthesis. And so, 
Looking at a diagram like this led astronomers to a new process. And I think I would submit to you today that we are roughly in the same position in studying galaxies. And what I'm going to be showing you is a lot of diagrams that really in essence look like HR diagrams for galaxy formation. And one of the things that you have to keep in mind when you look at these diagrams, just as for the HR diagram, that objects move in these diagrams. And uh, it's not just where they are at the moment, but where they were in the past and where they will be in the future. All right, so why do galaxies exist? We've made remarkable progress on this. This is supposed to be somebody's idea of quantum fluctuations during the epoch of inflation. And that little picture was back here when the universe was expanding faster than the speed of light. And that creates uh, a horizon that's analogous to the event horizon around a black hole, except inside out, it generates Hawking radiation and energy, mass energy, space-time fluctuations. And those fluctuations are the seeds of what make galaxies later. And fortunately, we can calculate the spectral energy density distribution of those fluctuations from first principles. And people use those to make models of galaxy formation. And here is a video by my colleagues um, at UC Santa Cruz from some years ago. This is supposed to be showing you the hierarchical clustering of dark matter only uh, centered on the Milky Way. Okay, so I'm making the point that dark matter halos are the scaffolding for galaxies and furthermore, that we understand very well from n-body simulations what the dark matter does. My first point then is that dark matter halos have their own scaling laws. And here's an example. Here's a radius, a virial radius versus uh, the total mass of a dark matter halo, mvir. And here are evolutionary trajectories of three different mass halos. Um, today, and this is what they look like in the past. So this is an example of one of those galaxy HR diagrams in which points move. Now that was for halos, but now I'm showing you the analogous diagram for effective radius of galaxies and versus their stellar mass. This is for star forming galaxies. And the black lines are predicted from the halos, the blue lines are observed. The blue lines are snapshots at various box redshifts. And so the goal here is to paint galaxies into halos in such a way as to make the predictions of the halos agree with the observations of the real galaxies. So let's pursue that a little bit further. Fundamental to what I'm going to say is uh, this relation, which is the relation between stellar mass and halo mass. This is an observed relation, and it comes from something called subhalo abundance matching, or sham. There have been many measurements of this, but they all show roughly the same thing. There's an early phase during which halo mass of a galaxy increases and its stellar mass increases rapidly. And then there's a transition phase in which there's a turnover here, and finally, a later phase in which halos continue to increase their mass, but stellar masses don't increase very fast, all right? And we see that galaxies that are in this phase are star forming, and these galaxies here are quenched. Now, for a long time, there's been a very plausible theory for why these halos here are quenched, going all the way back to 1977. And early authors pointed out that these massive halos would be, the gas in them would be very hot and also rather diffuse. And that combination means that gas cannot cool very rapidly. If it cannot cool, then the central galaxies are not fueled and star formation goes out. And so this process called halo quenching by some is one of the leading processes for uh, quenching star formation. Now, I submit to you today, and I'm going to be discussing, is this the right picture for galaxy quenching or is it more complicated? A complicated one in which AGN feedback beats against halo properties and quenches the halos. This is sort of the yang and yin of halo quenching that is to be debated. 
I have an opinion, and you will hear it by the end of the talk, namely, AGNs are really doing the job. Okay, so now in an effort to make my talk more accessible and more efficient for online people, especially people who come along later on YouTube and wonder, do I want to sit through and listen to this person for a whole hour? Uh, I have included these little summaries of chapters. And in the final version for the, uh, for the PowerPoint, I propose that we put these little summaries up front so that people will get a very quick idea of what the talk is about, and then they can decide whether or not they want to continue. All right, for today, we don't need to go through each one of these in detail. I just leave you with this question at the bottom, is quenching a property of the halos only or of AGNs interacting with the halos? This is the key question today about quenching. Now, I said we wanted to paint galaxies into halos in the right way so as to match the observations. Let me be clear. We are doing this in this picture only for star forming galaxies. This is a picture up to the point of quenching. So in step one, we need to match stellar mass to halo mass, and we can use this observed curve that I just showed you. And in fact, in this very simple picture in the paper I mentioned, this is the very simple rule we use. We use a power law in which the stellar mass is a power law function of the halo mass, m vir, and it's assumed to be infinitely narrow. You can see the real relation isn't that narrow, I mean, sorry, is not that broad as a function of, of redshift, um, at least not using this semi uh, subhalo abundance matching technique. Um, whether this ratio is broad or not and how it varies with redshift is an important unknown. I'm today going to make the simplest possible assumption. It's an infinitely thin power law and its zero point doesn't change with time. Now, the next property that we need to think about about star forming galaxies is how big they are. Uh, their effective radii are defined to contain 50% of the light. So here are observations from the candle survey going back in time. And the blue points are star forming galaxies. And I call your attention to their ridge lines here, which are marked by these black lines. It turns out, and I will not demonstrate to you in detail, that if you assume that the average star forming galaxy has a radius that is 2% of its virial radius on average over time, that actually matches these ridge lines within 20%. So that's our next assumption, a very, very simple assumption. How did we get that? We got it by using sham, comparing halos versus observed galaxies at a given epoch. And uh, this is the result. So now we're in a position to make uh, trajectories of real galaxies in plots of mass versus radius using the mass versus radius trajectories from the halos. Okay. Before we do that, I want to call attention to the fact that real star forming galaxies actually have some significant scatter in their radii at, at fixed mass. And um, I have a speculation as to why that is true. It turns out, if you think about it, that these halos back in time are actually a two parameter family. There's a um, size of mass on which the fluctuation exists versus the, the amplitude of the fluctuation back in time. That's its over density called delta. And here's a plot of how halos with different initial over densities behave as a function of time. Time is moving to the left in this diagram. These halos grew fast and they come out of initial over densities that are high. These grow more slowly and they come out of over densities that are low. Now it turns out then that the centers of these galaxies here, which are growing fast, they grew at a time when the universe was dense. The centers of those halos are condensed and we see them today as halos that have so-called high concentration. Whereas these halos over here forming late 
have lower concentration. This is confirmed from dark matter uh, studies of in-body simulations. And so there's a speculation that, in fact, I could add scatter to this plot of effective radii versus stellar mass if I allowed some objects to have lower concentration, they would have lower central densities and larger radii today, and the reverse for high concentration. So this is an interesting speculation. The thought that perhaps a two-parameter family of density fluctuations in the early universe might make a two-parameter family of star-forming galaxies today. And by the way, this correlation between radius and concentration is actually seen in model hydrodynamic um, models of galaxy formation in this recent paper by Jang et al. Okay, well now let me return to this diagram, another HR diagram for galaxy formation. And I'm calling attention now to the quenched galaxies, which are the red points on this diagram. And you can see that there's a rather good separation between the red points and the blue points. And so it's reasonable to think that galaxies are evolving, inspired by those tracks that we just saw from the halos, on tracks as, while star forming, and then that they come to a boundary at which point they begin to quench. And the dividing line that you see here between red points and blue points corresponds to star forming galaxies going over the boundary and beginning to quench. The way we define the boundary, it is the entrance to the so-called Green Valley, which is about half a dex in specific star formation rate below the star forming main sequence. And there are similar models for evolution of galaxies in this plane by previous papers, these previous authors. So this thought with us is, is not new. Here is my second summary, which I will move over rapidly, highlighting only the fact the speculation that there's a two-parameter family of initial density perturbations giving rise to a two-parameter family of star-forming galaxies today. And the point, very important point, that the boundary represents the entrance to the Green Valley where galaxies are beginning to quench. Now at this point, I'd like to introduce another galaxy parameter, sigma-1. Sigma-1 is defined as the projected central cellar density within a radius of 1 kpc at the center of the galaxy. And here is in one of the first papers that drew attention to it, data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And the interesting thing about this is that at fixed mass, Sigma-1 differentiates between quenched galaxies on the so-called red sequence and blue cloud star-forming galaxies. In other words, we have a quenched red sequence and a star forming blue cloud. Now I hope you're thinking, aha, these sequences look somewhat similar to the sequences that we just saw in radius versus mass. And that's not an accident because it is seen today and also back in time that the space of radius versus mass maps onto sigma versus mass for star forming galaxies. And it turns out that this is just a mathematical natural thing. It comes out automatically if you have a family of galaxies that all have about the same CERSIC index. And star forming galaxies all have a CERSIC index of about equal to one at the present time and also looking back in time. And so here's a, a, a very vivid example of that three dimensional relationship. Each one of these from the candle survey is a plot of radius versus mass. And you can we've colored by the central density. And you can see slanting lines there. That signifies that there's a plane. And the equation of this plane is given here. So we started out with the space of radius versus mass. And now we've added another parameter to it, sigma 1. If there are parallel tracks of evolution in the first space, because everything is a power law here, there are going to be parallel tracks in this new space of sigma 1 versus mass. And if there's a quenching boundary in the first space, there'll be one here in the second space. And as it turns out, without going into details, this quenching boundary is even 
more cleanly delineated, especially in the Sloan survey, and it seems to be displaced about two tenths of a dex below the quenched ridge line for the quenched galaxies. And again, that's the entry into the Green Valley. And here's a putative schematic track showing how a galaxy would evolve out of the blue cloud and into the Green Valley and finally take up residence here on the quenched ridge line. Now, we looked at the relationship for radius versus mass back in time. Let's take a look at the relationship for sigma one versus mass back in time. And um, no surprise, the same morphology is seen in all of these panels all the way back here to Z of three. And again, this makes sense because of the mapping between radius, mass, and sigma one. If one diagram looked regular, the other one will too. And so to summarize here, these sigma one mass relations are nearly the same at all redshifts. They stay in uh, the blue and the red galaxies stay in lockstep with one another. But one notices that the zero points of both families are not constant. In fact, they're moving down with time. There's a downward evolution in both zero points by about three tenths of a dex from Z of two and a half to now. And that's very important. Please keep that in mind. We'll come back to it in a second. Okay, scaling law is similar to radius versus mass because the two parameters are closely related. Now, why is sigma one an important parameter? Well, first of all, I've already mentioned the fact that the cleanest division between star forming and quenched galaxies at fixed mass occurs here with sigma one. It's better than R effective, little, little crisper, a little sharper. Uh, like R effective, it has a simple scaling law behavior back in time, which is encouraging because if we had a theory to account for this, we would be reproducing a huge aspect of galaxy evolution all the way since Z of three. That would be a big accomplishment. Unlike the effective radius, sigma one is a central parameter and therefore it is more immune to merging than the effective radius. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why the division between quenched and star forming is sharper using sigma one. And then the last reason why sigma one is important is that as we shall see in a second, it inspires a key model assumption, namely that the mass of a black hole scales as a power law function of sigma one, specifically sigma one to the 1.76 power. So here's a summary of what I just said. And the main thing to take away from this section is looking ahead, sigma one may tell us the black hole mass. Now I'm going to take a little bit of a detour and talk about a missing point. Where does the star forming main sequence come from? And where does this relationship, um, the stellar mass halo mass relation come from? because also that also depends on the star formation rate. So let's take a little deep detour. And I'll start by showing you a compilation of star forming main sequences. These are star forming galaxies uh, versus stellar mass going all the way back to Z of four. And as you all know, the relationship is quite narrow. The scatter about this relationship is only about plus or minus a factor of two in either direction. And the zero point is moving down with time and the slope may change also flatten with time, but that's, that, that's rather a small effect. Now, where might this come from? I'm emphasizing the connection between galaxies and dark halos, and it turns out that dark halos have their own mass accretion main se sequence. So plotted here is the rate at which the mass of a halo grows versus the halo mass as a function of time looking back in time. Call this the MAMS, the mass accretion main sequence. And you can derive the star forming main sequence from this, which I show in the next slide, provided you make a key assumption. So here we have observed points and the gray lines are the predicted star forming main sequence that we got from the previous slide. By assuming, and this is the important point, we had to assume the right 
stellar wind mass loading factor. So the mass loading factor is the ratio of the amount of material that goes out in a wind relative to the amount of material that stays in the galaxy and makes stars. And you can see that this is in general uh, rather flat and uh, near the valor, value unity, except for small halos when eta plus one goes up. Those are the galactic winds that I have in mind. And these winds were calculated assuming the bathtub model. What is the bathtub model? Shown in the next slide. The bathtub model says that there's some matter, some gas that falls onto a halo just because of gravitational instability and accretion. And it only has three choices. A particle of gas can go into forming stars, it can be driven out as a wind, or it could stay in the interstellar medium of the galaxy. But when you consider the relative time scales of these variables, it's quickly apparent that, in fact, the interstellar medium mass cannot change very much. There's not very much interstellar medium compared to everything else. And so uh, it's an attractor of the equations to assume that the interstellar medium mass isn't changing very much, in which case you only have these other two choices, namely star formation rate or wind. And that's this equation here. Gas coming in can either be in one or it can be in the wind eta. Okay, so now, um, this leads us to, again, this is a bit of a detour, a new reading of the schmidt kennicutt law. The traditional interpretation of the schmidt kennicutt law is that we have a certain gas density in a galaxy, and that gas density is making stars at a certain rate. So we input a gas density, and we get an output star formation rate. In contrast, the bathtub model turns things around. It says the universe is delivering gas to the galaxy. If we had a theory for winds, we would then know how much stars we have to make. That's the required star formation rate. And this is the required gas density to make those stars. We don't know the physics of this law, where it came from, but this um, thinking about the bathtub model and the way it delivers gas to the galaxy and what happens to that gas, suggests that, in fact, the right way to read the schmidt kennicutt law is backwards from the usual interpretation. I emphasize before leaving this, this point that um, we don't have a theory for the winds. So that will be one of my outstanding questions about galaxy formation. So here is a summary of this part three, which is about the star formation rate. And the high point here is that the star forming main sequence of galaxies can be derived from a similar sequence for halo by assuming the right wind strength. Okay, that really completes my description of how galaxies evolve what's known and not known about them during the star forming phase. But the second part of my talk is about quenching. So let's talk about that. There are two quenching channels that are observed. This is a mass function for all galaxies. And this is the mass function for quenched galaxies as a function of time. And you can see how the number of galaxies right around here between 10 and 11 in the log is increasing as a function of time. This other channel does increase also, but it occurs late. The low mass channel sets in around a Z of one, and it looks like it is more um, related to satellite quenching effects, environmental quenching effects. And I should have said at the beginning of my talk that this whole talk is really just to talk about central galaxies, not satellites. And so the quenching at issue here is not satellite quenching, but rather the quenching that happens to the central galaxy. So for the remainder of my talk, what I want to focus on here is this range of masses, the high mass classic S zeros in elliptical galaxies of today. What quenched them? Well, let's go back to this picture that we just looked at, the quenching boundary in the space of sigma one versus stellar mass. 
here's a sample galaxy trajectory. How do we move from there? Well, I need to show you some data. I want you to see what this quenching boundary looks like back in time in the candle survey. So first of all, I'm going to show you radius versus mass. These are quenched galaxies, and you will observe that they all lie below the line. And the star-forming galaxies tend to lie above the line. That's where the quenching boundary is in this space. And then just to review, uh, here's the quenching boundary as shown in the sigma-1 versus mass space. These are the quenched galaxies, and these are the star-forming galaxies. And by the way, let me, uh, I the Faber-Jackson relation was mentioned in the introduction. This is the Faber-Jackson relation. Why do I say that? Because this coordinate sigma one is closely related to the velocity dispersion. And this coordinate here is mass, which is closely related to the luminosity for quenched galaxies. So this little space here with its tilt is in fact the Faber-Jackson relation. And one of the conclusions from our work here is that if we could understand the origin of the slant of this boundary, we would have explained one of the important scaling laws for galaxies. All right, so I just want to illustrate an obvious point that these boundaries are slanted in this landscape. They are not vertical at fixed mass. In other words, stellar mass is not a good predictor of when a galaxy will quench. There must be another variable that is involved, the physics of another variable that is involved. So the quenching boundary is not vertical at fixed mass. There must be a second parameter, and what is it? Let's, let's explore that. The way forward is now to think about the black hole. And <clears throat> as I noted before, we're going to assume that the mass of the black hole is related to sigma to the 1.76 power during the star forming phase. Now, why would we be inspired to think about this? Why would this make sense? Well, you probably have heard that there's a sigma to the fourth rule in which the mass of black holes scales roughly as the velocity dispersion in the galaxy. But in addition, you may not know that this parameter sigma one is very closely related to velocity dispersion this way. And so just out of the blue from what we know already, we might predict that the black hole scales as sigma one to the 2.0. What we're going to find out is in fact that it's not quite 2.0, but it's close. So if black hole mass is a power of sigma one, there are some important implications. Let's go back to this space of effective radius versus stellar mass and recall that there were slanted lines of constant sigma one in this space. They look like that. We now know from this assumption that those are also lines of constant black hole mass. And to the extent for star forming galaxies that sigma one maps into effective radius, which is pretty good, it means that we can actually read off black hole masses directly from the radius and stellar mass of a galaxy. And we're actually not the first people to, to, to say that. Vandenbosch in 2016 and Krasnovitz et al. in 2018 made the same point. I pause there to say that that's very important because we normally think that measuring black hole masses is a tedious process that requires very elaborate observations and careful modeling. In this picture, in fact, it's simpler. You can read it right off for star forming galaxies from their global structure. And that's a very interesting thing that could be tested and put to use. Now, the next thing I want to point out is the fact that there is scatter in the radius here. I called attention to the scatter. And if you look at the colors in this graph, you can see that down here, sigma is bigger and therefore it has a larger black hole. Whereas sigma smaller, these objects have smaller black holes. 
And according to the numbers in the theory, this difference across the distribution of radii is a factor of 16. It's substantial. That's what I'm trying to say. Big uh, galaxies with large radii are penalized in terms of their black hole mass. Now, that has a consequence. Supposing, looking ahead a little bit, we have some sort of quenching theory. It, it makes plausible sense to think that a larger object here would have to evolve farther in order to get a black hole mass that's big enough to quench. Whereas these objects down here have bigger black hole masses and might evolve less far. And in fact, that's what the picture is going to show. This is a picture of the quenching boundary as it existed. I showed it to you in sigma one versus stellar mass. Now we can map it into this space, effective radius versus stellar mass. This is what it looked like. And it's slanted in this, in this space as well. So to summarize, it's the fact that there's a range of black hole radii in star forming galaxies of different size that causes the tilt and also the extent of the quenching boundary uh, in, in, in mass. Okay, so just to drive this home a little bit and make the theory a little bit clearer, the blue line you see here is an evolutionary trajectory of a galaxy, and it's going to wind up with 10.6 solar masses today, and it's going to live in a halo mass of 12.1, um, 10 to the 12.1 today. And this is its evolutionary trajectory. <clears throat> this is where it was at a redshift of 1.76. And the red line is where the quenching boundary was. Now remember, I told you that the quenching boundary must move down in sigma one versus mass because the ridge line is moving down and the quenching boundary is tied to that. Radius is the opposite of that. If things move down in one space, they move up in the other space. So the quenching boundary is moving up in this space. And here now we can follow the galaxy's motion and the quenching boundary motion. And finally, they intersect. And this, according to the model, this galaxy would have quenched back at a redshift of something like 0.43. Now, the point to make here, which surprised us greatly, we sort of thought that things would evolve on parallel tracks and run into boundaries like this. But in fact, they evolve on parallel tracks and the boundary overtakes them. It's the motion of the boundary that causes these galaxies to quench. And finally, here's a summary of what a selection of galaxies with the same halo mass but different effective radii would look like. The typical one is the black line. <clears throat> and the ones below the black line would have slightly higher central densities and higher black holes, and therefore quench earlier. But they all start with 10 to the ninth solar masses at a redshift of 2.8. All right, so I want to now say more about the black hole. The observed um, black hole stellar mass plane resembles the sigma one stellar mass plane. And here is a selection of measured black holes versus stellar mass today. The points are color coded by star formation rate. And uh, here's uh, the matching graph from the Sloan survey that I already showed you. So you can see actually that the morphology of these two diagrams is very similar, especially when you take into account that a certain portion should be mapped onto a, a certain region in the other graph. Okay. So because everything is a power law, if we have parallel tracks while star forming in this plot over here of sigma one, we are going to have parallel evolution in black hole mass in this plot. And so now it's beginning to emerge that this actually is a rather comprehensive picture. We we're talking about halos, now we're talking about galaxies, and now we're talking by assumptions here about how the black hole can actually evolve in these pictures. Okay, so here is a summary of where we are to date. We now have a four-dimensional space. The basic variable is stellar mass, and versus that, we have 
sigma one, we have effective radius, and we have black hole mass. And if you know where a galaxy is in any one of those pair of coordinates, you can map it to the other two sets, okay? And here, this is shown here. I'm using Candle's galaxies for these two panels looking back in time. This is radius versus mass. SMA is semi-major axis. And this is sigma one. And finally, we have black holes. We don't measure black holes back in time. This is the same selection of local black holes measured by um, Terrazas et al. in 2017. Okay, so a lot hinges here on the quenching boundary. What is the physics of the quenching boundary in this really simple model? What we say is that the black hole, the quenching galaxies begin to quench, i.e. they enter the Green Valley when the black hole energy feedback that their black holes have been emitting in the process of forming overcomes, in quote, the halo gas binding energy. So let's just summarize what we mean by that. As you all know, black holes emit radiation when they accrete. This is the rough formula. This is the rest mass energy. And the effective energy coming out is typically taken to be about 1%. Now, early in the history of a galaxy, the halo has a low velocity dispersion and its gas is cool. And so um, gas falls in and fuels star formation because cold, dense gas cools well. But meanwhile, the black hole is growing, the gas is absorbing energy from the black hole, and when the following condition is met, we say that the halo gas has absorbed enough energy to stop cooling and galaxies start to quench. So what is the condition? Black hole energy is approximately four times the halo gas binding energy, where the gas binding energy is just, this is the kinetic energy of the gas in the halo, the mass of gas and the variable velocity squared, okay? So I'll, I'll pause there and, uh, and say that, um, this is a little bit different from a picture of quenching criterion that has shown up, especially in semi-analytic models, because in, uh, in those models, the quenching criterion has been a rate criterion. What has been compared is the rate at which the black hole emits its energy versus the rate at which the gas in the halo wants to lose energy and cool. Whereas this is a total energy criterion, total energy from the hole versus total gas binding energy. So this represents a significant change in viewpoint. And I will simply say at this time that um, some more detailed hydrodynamic models, which are not overtly making this assumption, but nevertheless make a series of other plausible assumptions, they actually are coming to the same conclusion that the quenching criterion is a total energy criterion and not a rate criterion. All right, so what's the import of this? Here in this slide, I have, I have compiled in more detail the quenching boundaries that are observed empirically. Those are these red slanted lines. And this theory that I just told you, namely that you will enter the Green Valley when the, the black hole energy equals four times the binding energy. That produces the blue lines in this plot. So this is probably the major achievement of this paper, which I'm reviewing for you. You'll notice that the blue lines are pretty much the right slope to match the red lines. And pretty much they go down in zero point at the right, by the right amount. It's not perfect, but nevertheless, this is an incredibly crude model. I think it's encouraging, and it suggests that this is the right avenue to think about quenching something to do with total energy going in and influencing halos. And we haven't said anything about what the nature of that interaction is. is. I, I've sort of used absorb enough energy. I've used sort of illustrative words, but in fact, maybe it's a pushing aside, maybe it's an unbinding instead of a heating, we don't know. 
the, the picture is completely um, agnostic about that. And that's a, an important point to be filled in. Okay, so here's the summary of this part of the talk. And there are really two points that are most important. Galaxies evolve parallel to the boundary and it's the sideways motion of the boundary that causes the galaxies to quench. Why is the boundary moving sideways? It's because of this uh, heating condition four times the halo gas binding energy has that property that if you put it in, it changes the zero point of the boundary. So it's um, an increasing propensity of halos to be able to be quenched as a function of time that creates the motion of the boundaries in these scaling laws. And finally, the last point is that galaxies enter the Green Valley when uh, the black hole has four times the halo binding energy. All right, I'm almost finished. I have only one more chapter to talk about. And what I'd like to talk about is the evolution in black hole mass as we go through the Green Valley, because this was another surprise. I've, I've shown you this picture before, but now I want to draw a different conclusion from it. Before, I encouraged you to think that these two spaces were the same. And now I want you to see that there's a difference in the sense that there's a, a large zero point shift here between the E galaxy ridgeline and where star forming ends. In other words, this whole thing is the Green Valley, whereas the same space here is compressed into only 0.2 decks. So something is different after galaxies pass into the Green Valley. And this was actually recently captured in an important new paper by Teraza et al who noted that in fact, there's a new scaling law for galaxies. These are star forming galaxies on the star forming main sequence. These are fully quenched galaxies. And they uh, were able to show that in fact, there is a steady increase in black hole mass through the Green Valley as galaxies go out. So we can quantify that. I, Schematically, I put in two mean points. Here is the last mean point. Galaxies have been doing this on the main sequence. This is where they begin to leave the main sequence. This is fully quenched. This is a, an evolutionary track between those two points. And here is the difference in black hole mass at face value. It's a factor of 30. In other words, part of that number might have to do with progenitor evolution and so on in these mo moving boundaries, but nevertheless, it seems safe to say that at least 90% of black hole growth takes place as galaxies cross the, the, the Green Valley. Uh, this is in contrast to the parameter sigma one. Here side by side are two plots that show how sigma one is evolving as galaxies quench versus how the black holes evolve. And you can see, using my two sort of last points here, there's a, only a small difference in sigma one between star forming galaxies and fully quenched galaxies, uh, in contrast to the big difference in black hole mass. In other words, we can say that sigma one stalls in the Green Valley. Meanwhile, black hole mass continues to grow. And from the benefit of hindsight, we can actually see that in these two plots that I showed you earlier, see how narrow this distribution is and how close it is to the boundary. And whereas this distribution is very broad and that's reflecting the change, the increase in black hole mass through the Green Valley. So that says that our old rule for black hole mass needs to change. That black hole, that rule might obtain for galaxies while they're star forming, but it's not true in the Green Valley. And that inspires a cartoon. This is our cartoon version of the model, which sums up everything that I have said. The black hole growth is shallow, i.e. it goes as sigma to the 1.76 while star forming. And then a galaxy encounters the boundary and black hole mass growth increases relative to sigma one here. So there's a kink. This slope here in the blue part is 1.76. This slope, if I take the numbers literally, is 
Now, what we've done in order to get the slopes and, and calibrate this theory, we have assumed the same green valley vectors for all galaxy masses and all redshifts, which is a pretty sweeping assumption. And um, the paper gives you some reason for thinking that that might be a valid thing. Principally, those wonderful uh, plots of uh, radius and, and sigma one back in time. So um, this, just to review, would be a dense galaxy with a small radius turning off at an early time, whereas at the same mass, we would have a much physically larger radius with a smaller black hole evolving to a larger value of sigma one and turning off. And if our assumption is correct that all of these green vectors are the same for all masses and all times, it means that the quenched ridge line is always parallel to and offset by the same amount from the star forming ridge line. And this should be true at all redshifts. So let's do a little bit of comparison to data. Oh, before I do that, I, sh I should tell you where this number 1.76 comes from, which I've constantly invoked. We have two observed relations locally for the quenched ridge line. On the quenched ridge line, black hole mass is a power law of stellar mass and sigma one is a power law of stellar mass. If you take those two relations and divide one by the other, you find that black hole mass is a power law of sigma one and the ratio of the exponents is this number 1.76. So 1.76 is in some sense observed. Okay, well, I wanted to talk about a little bit about data. This is the uh, latest compilation I've been able to find of black hole mass versus velocity dispersion. And velocity dispersion goes closely with sigma one. So I want you to think of this as sigma one. And it's long been a puzzle that it's hard to fit all of these galaxies with a single power law. Instead, it looks as though these, um, these are star forming here. These galaxies are offset from the quenched ridge line by some amount. And this little cartoon that I've been showing you is, is predicts that. And it would say that these objects down here, which are still star forming, will eventually turn off, evolve through the Green Valley, and their black holes will increase in the process. And I, I was particularly pleased to see that this picture actually helps explain a longstanding problem with the Milky Way and M31. The Milky Way and M31 don't differ very much in mass. They don't very diff differ very much in sigma one either. And yet their black hole masses differ by a factor of 50. And that most, most of that explanation may be due to the fact that the Milky Way is still on the star forming main sequence, whereas um, M31, and has a pseudo bulge, whereas M31 has evolved through, almost all the way through the Green Valley and is really effectively going out. It has a big bulge and it's grown its black hole. Okay, one last point about data. Um, the rule that I have given you that black hole mass goes to sigma to the 1.76, predicts a velocity trend of only 3.58. And those of you who are familiar with black hole scaling laws know that in general, people fit and find exponents that are closer to four or even more than five. The paper discusses this discrepancy at length. And um, part of it, a large part of it, comes from the fact that some of these fit, put galaxies, all galaxies together, trying to fit a single power law. and um, you need a steeper slope in order to accommodate that. And in fact, the difference exactly matches the difference in uh, fitted slopes in, in some of the published papers. So the bottom line is, yes, there is a lovely correspondence between galaxy properties and black holes, but it's different for quenched galaxies, Green Valley galaxies, and star forming galaxies. So in investigating scaling laws for black holes, it's important to put objects into the proper category. Okay, this is my summary for the last part of the talk. Black hole gas growth takes off even as star formation begins to shut down. There's this curious 
point uh, in the Green Valley, uh, why would the black hole grow just when star formation is, is declining? There's a long discussion in the paper about why that might be. It seems to be showing up in some hydrodynamic models, but many points are still unknown. Okay, this is my last slide. Uh, here's a scorecard on phenomena that should be explained if we claim to understand galaxy formation. So up above, are topics on which I think we have made major progress. Why galaxies exist, et cetera. I won't read them for you. Um, and basically the picture that is helpful is that halos give rise in a predictable way to star forming galaxies. Star forming galaxies give rise in a predictable way to their black holes. Black holes quench in a predictable way the halos of star forming galaxies. And that little sort of three part logic manages to uh, explain evolution up to the quenching boundary. Well, through my talk, though, I've alluded to several questions I've told you that are still outstanding. I've mentioned the fact that we don't understand stellar winds, and that means uh, we also don't understand the metallicities of gas and stars and galaxies because the winds carry metals out of the galaxy. We don't understand the physics of the schmidt kennicott law. We can understand perhaps that we should be reading it backwards, but why there is a law, we don't, we don't fully understand. Something I did not talk about, but which I think is very important, is the fact that the star forming mean sequence is not infinitely narrow. Galaxies lie above and below that. Why? Is that a short-term fluctuation or a long-term fluctuation? Where does it come from? The black hole growth physics, I've just pulled black hole formation out of the air. I've not said anything about why these power laws would be obeyed, either while galaxies are star forming or um, when they're in the Green Valley. I haven't said anything in detail about how black holes might interact with the halo gas. I've said nothing about galaxy evolution before Z of three, dwarf galaxies really, uh, the morphologies of galaxies, what environment might, might do, what mergers might do. Mergers are ignored in everything that I've talked about. And finally, a big thing uh, is dust and its effects because distant galaxies are very gas rich and presumably have a lot of dust in them. We can see that. And it, it's a possi possible that some of the structural parameters that we're measuring for distant gas rich galaxies are are perturbed by the fact that we don't see through the dust. Nevertheless, I think this, we can say though that a general picture for galaxy formation is one of the great achievements of modern astronomy, especially since we're able to invoke fundamental physics going back to 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang. We're all here thanks to a quantum fluctuation. We're all Schrodinger's cat. The mystery of Schrodinger's cat is what happens when a quantum fluctuation gets frozen in? Well, that's how our galaxy got made. So thank you very much. Wonderful, everyone applauds. <laughs> thank you so much, Sandy, wonderful talk. Beautiful summary. We have a tsunami of questions here. <laughs> So before we go into the Q&A, uh, I want to give the opportunity for the panel members to start asking you. And Franz has raised his hand. So Franz, please go ahead. Hi, thank you very much, Sandy, uh, for the interesting talk. So um, I, it's hard to wrap my head around the, the, the results in, in an hour or so, but I had a, a couple of questions. So I'll, I'll only ask one because there's probably other questions. But um, so one, sort of missing element here is the gas, the amount, the location, how it, how it actually is um, sort of playing a role in this model. And you say it, it kind of all goes into the stars right away, but it would be very useful to actually check that. Um, <laughs> and you know, this is pr particularly critical for however we're gonna grow the black holes because they're now growing almost, almost all of the, you know, that growth happens in the Green Valley. Um, when this, when the galaxies are, are presumably quenched or quenching, mm -hmm. um, and so you know, Alma is starting to weigh in here. How do the early results that are coming out of Alma 
tie into this model that you're you're formulating from kind of the end product what do, what do you have in mind there by way of early results um well certainly the, the almond results are tracking where the gas is um how much of the gas you know the gas density um where things are kind of growing and I'm, I'm just trying to to weigh in for instance um you know so your model says um, the central star density is going to increase as galaxies grow and then at some point they get to a, a point where that sort of stops and they're halted but then the black hole still grows and so how, where is the gas that's growing the black hole how does it flow in yeah isn't that, that is isn't that a wonderful question <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think you know it's, it's totally counterintuitive somehow that we're getting rid of gas in some parts of the galaxy and yeah. so the, the, about the only thing to say there are actually hydro models that actually do this in which um the the the, the uh black hole growth takes off late and the saving grace of the black hole is that it doesn't weigh very much and so you can have a theory for the gas in the galaxy as a whole doing whatever but you only need a little bit of gas near the center of the galaxy in order to accrete and make the black hole. So this is why I quizzed you a little bit. I really don't see a very good connection yet, correct me if I'm wrong, between ALMA gas measurements and the accretion of the black hole because the physical scales are so different. We are busy comparing to global gas measurements and global estimates of gas from star formation rates and dust contents and so on. But I'm not even seeing any relationship that's very useful yet between that and what the black hole is doing. So this is a huge mystery. Okay, so we would like to uh, have some more questions from the Q&A. So Evelyn, did you pick out a few? Yeah, so one of the, um, the most upvoted uh, questions we have is from Borislav Nedelchev. Why would one expect a somewhat regular scaling between the halo mass and the baryons that end up embedded inside when there is a somewhat complicated process of accretion of the gas that might lead to shocks? Uh. So I think how can we get how can we assume these simple scaling relations from such complicated physics that go into them? Well, I think what um, I think what first of all I've had two questions that really uh, are focused on gas, but let me just say that that was a little bit of a detour in my talk, in the sense that we can infer a star formation rate from the stellar mass halo mass relation. We don't need to understand the physics of the gas. In fact, we should be using that relation to deduce the physics of the gas. So um, I think you should, you should treat my, my statements about winds and the bathtub model and so on as wonderful predictions that really should be compared against hydrodynamic models. And do they work for hydrodynamic models? And do the hydrodynamic models put objects on the stellar mass halo mass relation? So this is a great opportunity for me to, to, to make an advertisement for all of these diagrams that I'm showing you. How did we test stellar evolution? We plotted objects in the HR diagram. How should we test galaxy evolution? I've shown you four or five critical diagrams that are analogous and that's, these are the diagrams that modelers should be using to test their theories. Um, so another question we had from Guilhermo Cotto. Uh, some works indicate that the M sigma relation is not true for some types of galaxies, such as pseudobulges. How does this affect the estimation of quenching boundaries when assuming the M sigma relation holds for a broad range of stellar masses? Mm. Okay, well, I, I hope to uh, address that in one of my final slides there, where I showed you how a two part theory for formation uh, of black holes during the star forming phase and later in the phase of, uh, Gal of the Green Valley actually does match uh, observations for pseudobulges quite nicely, I think. 
Uh, shall we go back to the panel? I noticed that yes. Marcin has... see Gustavo is waving his hand at us. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Gustavo. Hi, Sandy. Thank you for the talk. I have a, a very naive question. These galaxies that they call relics, that are, they haven't had have any evolution from the beginning of, of the universe. So how they fit in this picture? They, they were quenched at, at birth. Uh, they never went to the Green Valley or how they, they have- Gosh, I don't know what you're referring to. I'm embarrassed to say, what do you mean? The relic galaxies, the ones that are very red, that they haven't had have any merger, that seems to have a, a, a very old stellar population without any evolution. They should have a very big uh, black hole. Uh, they, should, they should have formed from um, uh, uh, they they should have they should have formed early from in, in the universe from objects that had high initial overdensity quenched early. I don't think it's a problem that okay. they that nothing has happened to them since then. And in fact, if you notice um, a big missing gap in my talk, I should have added it to questions outstanding. Is how galaxies evolve after they're quenched. I talked about evolution of the black hole, but I didn't talk about um, dry mergers or um, increases in, in the size of effective radii or perhaps lingering star formation or any of those things. But they should have equally big black holes as the recently quenched ones? I think you should look at their sigma one values and that's how you would tell. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Martin had his hand raised. Um, wonderful talk, Sandy. It's it's always wonderful to hear you speak, and this was no exception. And Thank you. I, I have a question about um, on your last slide. You you know you mergers well morphologies I should say were were uh, were in the second list the the things that are still question marks. So I wanted to ask you what. Um, you know, I know you don't have an answer right? uh, because it's in the second list, but what can you, you know, what, what is, where do you think the answer will come from as to how the, how the, you know, uh, how this uh, propensity for star forming galaxies to be, to have different shapes than quenched galaxies? Where, how is that going to connect? Where is your feeling on that? Well, <clears throat> this I think is, is, a, a, is a question now really ripe for study. Uh, if, we, if we think we understand the trajectory of galaxies through these basic diagrams, then it inspires the view that, first of all, you get to the quench sequence, um, unless you're a satellite, let's set those aside, all right? I keep saying that, um, that you just quench, you just go out. And what should you look like? You should look like an S0. And so I'm guessing that we make S zeros, and then they are bombarded by a bunch of minor mergers and get fluffed up and look like ellipticals. And a long time ago, we did a study, should be repeated with better data, to count the fraction of S zeros versus ellipticals as a function of mass along the quenched ridge line. And it's certainly increasing as you go down in mass. There are many more S zeros. So that, that would say that at the top of the quench ridge, I'm, for the very largest masses, I'm, I'm sure are produced purely by mergers. And the recently quenched galaxies are sitting around masses of 10.5 to 11 or something like that. And a lot of them should look like S zeros. Be wonderful to see how that changes as a function of time because then you could study the rate at which the morphologies were getting converted from S zeros into E's. I'm a proponent to think that actually it's not so hard to tell the difference between an S0 and an E. I might be a little too optimistic there, but that's my view. Is it here? Yes, thank you. Um, so, okay, I, can, I will try to formulate the question. See, which is more like chicken and egg and is especially involving M sigma because uh, as you say, probably most of establishing M sigma is more related to mergers, which are of course probably not important for the majority of the sources uh, of the of the galaxies as, as you mentioned at the, at the end or you are out did, of did this I, did framework. Did I say that? Can I just... No, you mentioned... Oh, sorry. I, yes. So, 
because you, you said something there that I might disagree with. So I just want to make sure I understood you. First of all, which M sigma are you talking about? The, the M black hole sigma. The M okay. sigma relation, which seems to be at the, at the basis for the relation between M, M black hole and sigma one, right? Okay, continue. Right, so um, this, it seems to be unrelated. So, so the establishment of M sigma seems to be unrelated with the quenching. So I was wondering how much do you need M sigma to be in place in order to understand the quenching and, and, and then I was wondering about the evolution of all this because we, we suspect that M sigma also both with redshift. Um, also what's with redshift? Evolves with relative M sigma ah, changes yes. with, with relative ah, might change with relative. Correct. M M sigma evolves with redshift because M sigma is one of our HR diagrams, like sigma one versus mass, M black hole versus mass is the same, and we have a moving ridge line. And in fact, we predict just as sigma one that ridge line was higher in the past, observed to be higher. You can compute if we uh, maintain this rule between sigma one and, um, and black hole mass, we predict actually this increase in the ridge line of black hole mass versus time. So very often people say, ah, the fact that that zero point is high reflects the fact that black holes are forming before stars. But no, as you've noted, we say, that black holes form in the black in the green valley, which is after most of the stars. And the reason for this apparent discrepancy is the fact that the ridge line actually has moved. And so uh, what you see is uh, back in time is a relic of what black holes were doing and quenching on a different ridge line back in time. Let me repeat that actually the quenching boundary and the physics of the quenching boundary in this picture come from the star forming galaxy assumptions. And uh, what we then paste on top of that is a green valley that is always the same for every mass and every redshift. And that relates the scaling laws for quenched galaxies to the scaling laws for star forming galaxies. And they're all moving in, in lockstep by assumption, but that seems to agree rather well with the data. So okay. somewhat related to this, I have a question for you. <laughs> um, so, so there is there is this feeding function of black holes, of course, coming from the dwarf galaxy regime, right? And, and that is sort of defining the whole evolution throughout the Green Valley. Do you have you know, anything um, explored so far that is at mass ranges less than 10 to the 9 solar masses? Is there enough data to to say something about this feeding function of low mass or intermediate mass black holes that grow into this ridge line? Um, I, uh, I would say that they would only be important insofar as the mass added to Milky Way-like galaxies from such galaxies is significant compared to the stellar mass grown in the galaxy itself. And I think that the mass accreted in dwarfs is very small. And so I would claim that the contribution of accreted black hole mass to say the Milky Way's mass is likewise small. So with these, given these prejudices, I confess I haven't thought about it. Okay. Okay, I have another question, but let's, let's move to Felipe now. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks, Sandy, for, for that wonderful talk. Um, I know you, you talk about you know central galaxies you know dominant galaxies but you know what what's the role of for of environment on this picture is there any uh, yeah. there isn't any yeah, that's, I mean, that's what I mean, I'm that, I, I've just told you these central galaxies have halos that's their environment <laughs> right yeah, but then yeah but then the dispersion or you have to go down in in mass or luminosity to get to see effects of, of an environment on I think to see effects of environment one should be looking at the satellite population okay okay and there there I think all bets are off um, there are a couple papers on this I'm a, a co-author on one of them <clears throat> uh, the chief author is Joanna Wu 
she essentially, in this paper, she examined the sigma one properties of satellite galaxies. And a very interesting fact emerged. She found that in the Green Valley, the sigma one valleys, uh, values of satellites are lower. And so, again, in a very hand wavy way, the paper said, aha, maybe there are two contributions to quenching. Part of it is internal coming from your black hole. But if you're a satellite, maybe there's some quenching that's coming from the environment. And maybe, therefore, satellites in halos can start quenching when they have smaller black holes, as indicated by their smaller sigma one. In fact, it's very hard to find a difference in, in, in the structural parameters between galaxies that are satellites and halos and galaxies that are in the field. And this is one of the few things I think that has actually been seem to be different for satellite galaxies. And it's, it's intriguing that it's sigma one if sigma one has something to do with black holes. Okay. Hello. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, very well, go ahead. Okay, uh, so thank you for your talk. And um, I have a question buzzing, buzzing in my head uh, quite a while now. Um, you start your talk uh, comparing a uh, HR diagram for stars uh, and star evolution theory to uh, diagrams that allow us to test evolution in galaxies. But I see a main difference between stars and galaxies and is that the stars mostly do not interact between themselves. Mm. I mean, they, they evolve uh, only because of, uh, mostly because of nucleosynthesis. Uh, but uh, galaxies collide and they merge, they interact between themselves. So yes. how do mergers uh, fit into uh, the picture uh, that, you, that you showed us? Right. So uh, simply put, they don't fit. <laughs> In the sense that we've made a bunch of simple rules and we've simply ignored the existence of mergers. So I want to stress again that the theory is in two parts. We need an initial part for star forming galaxies, and then they reach a boundary and there's black holes in the Green Valley, and there's also what the rest of the galaxy does during, during um, the Green Valley and after that. So I do believe that mergers are having a major effect on, on galaxy formation in that later phase. Now, I'm not oblivious to your question. I think it's a really good question. And the only reason why we didn't consider it was because this is the first paper and it's a pencil and paper exercise. So really, the right way to, to, to handle this is now to go to a hydrodynamic simulation that has all the right black holes and gas and all of that in it. And the very first thing you would look at in such a simulation is whether or not its behavior of sigma one versus mass is for star forming galaxies is a narrow relationship, point number one, and does it change zero point as a function of time the way the real one does? And people are taking a look at this and the answer for a lustrous TNG is yes. Now, I think that the black hole for, uh, formation mechanism in the lustrous TNG is not the right one. I say this because they're predicting black holes for small galaxies, star forming galaxies that are 100 times bigger than observed. So something's wrong there. But a way forward is to take that hydro simulation that has all the mergers and stuff that you need in it and put a very simple black hole growth law into it. And then you have halos in that simulation and you can test whether or not those halos, those black holes would quench those halos, etc. So um, I, I know that um, uh, some people are beginning to take this point of view. I agree that we need a more realistic next step. And I think actually the star forming galaxies in hydrodynamic models are the next way to go. So I have an, another couple of audience questions. Um, I'm going to start with a question from David Koo, who I'm aware is, is he, from the is he working on the same corridor as you? Yeah, uh, this is trouble. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I chose it. Okay. Um, do you expect most AGN should be seen in the Green Valley at all redshifts? Mm, very good question. Um, 
by the way, let me give credit where credit is due. We've been studying central densities in galaxies for several years, and the person in our team who had the intuition early on that we should be measuring sigma one and trying to see what it does, it was David. This was his idea. Um, so back to your question, David, where should we see AGNs? This is, a, this is a problem with the theory. This is probably the major piece of evidence, I think, that doesn't support what I've said today. Because you would think if black holes are growing rapidly in the Green Valley, that's where you should find AGNs. Now, in fact, you do find a lot of AGNs there. It's not a frequency problem. Uh, Sherwinsky pointed this out a long time ago. But this, is, this is where the uh, AGNs occur. Uh, the problem is that the AGNs that we see are not bright enough. Galaxies don't spend that much time in the Green Valley. And um, there isn't that much time for them to allow them to accrete. If you're going to say, hey, you got 90% of your mass there, you can calculate an accretion rate. If that scales to, say, X-ray luminosity, we should be seeing fearfully bright objects as a rule when we see an AGN. We don't see that. We see plenty of AGNs, but they are not bright enough. So I don't know the answer to this, but I am wondering whether or not actually um, maybe those AGNs accrete and radiate in a different way. And so we know, for example, that illustrious, I'll, I'll allude to it again, has two accretion modes and two ways in which energy comes out of the black hole. One is the quasar mode. It comes out in form of radiation. That would show us x-rays. But the other mode is the kinematic mode which would be very low luminosity in X-rays uh, and would send bulk flows with kinetic energy into the halo. So perhaps the holes are accreting, but um, sending out their energy in a different way. I do not know, but it's a major question. Um, and I have another question, uh, much simpler this time. This mm -hmm. is asked by quite a, quite a few people on the Q&A. Um, how do you measure the black hole mass? Mm. Um, black hole masses um, are measured mainly locally because it takes detailed measurements near the black hole. The classic way is to measure stellar motions near the black hole. Some black holes have disks of gas right around them that are orbiting and close to circular motion, and you can measure the, the mass that way. Moving beyond that, there's there are correlations between the luminosities of uh, black holes and their emission lines and the widths of those emission lines that have been calibrated using a few objects. And then there's something called reverberation mapping that takes account of the fact that you see different features appearing at different times during an outburst and you can use that to get the distance of a packet of gas from the, the hole. You can measure the velocity of that gas from a line width, then you have the radius of an orbit and an orbital velocity. This is a long-winded way of saying that there are many ways of measuring these black hole masses, but most of them, aside from the, the quasar method, based on emission line widths, are only applicable to nearby black holes. So to the extent that we have masses far away, I believe they really depend on AGN calibrations. Uh, yes, so Brian has his hand up. Brian, do you want to ask your question? Okay, thank you. Yeah, very interesting talk. Um, I like to go back to the bathtub model and your assumption that the ISM mass doesn't increase seems it might be related to disk instabilities. Mm. <laughs> Do you have any insight on that? No, not really. No, <laughs> I wish I could, could say that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, might be related to um, swings up and down about the star forming main sequence. A main Major question is what's the duration of those excursions? And um, there's a nice paper by um, Sandro Takella and uh, Kaplar, I think his, his name is, in which they correlate um, uh, the way in which various spectral features with different time scales evolve as a function of uh, motions up and down, concluding that maybe the excursions have time scales of 100 million or 150 million years. 
Um, this might be related to blobs of gas falling on, or it might be related to a disk instability. I think there's, oh, sh can I say something that we've just separately figured out? As far as I know, nobody's ever really called attention to this. This is really important. I've been emphasizing the fact that in the radius versus mass diagram, there's a range of radii. It is extremely important that as far as we can tell, at any redshift, there is no relation between the radius of a galaxy and its star formation rate. This is, this is unbelievable to me because the, the, the intuitive thought you might have had was that, um, let's start with the assumption that all galaxies have the same gas to star ratio. Then if we make a galaxy smaller, we increase the gas surface density in the schmidt kennicutt law, we move up and we have more stars made. That's because the exponent is bigger than one, it's 1.4. So basically, if I condense the gas in a galaxy, it ought to make stars more rapidly. And yet, in observed galaxies as a function of size, as a function at a fixed stellar mass, there's very little detectable variation. This is, this is another major test for hydrodynamic models. Do they reproduce this and why? Great, thank you. So I noticed we, have a, oh. we have a question from uh, Hans Zinnecker uh, in the Q&A. Do you assume the same universal star formation laws and IMF independent of the gas surface densities in your scales? Um, again, I'm getting lots of questions on this little detour on star formation. The main theory doesn't assume anything about star formation. It assumes the stellar mass to halo mass relation and just says, hey, we don't know why, but that's the way the universe gal of galaxies makes stars in order to obey that relation. Um, in more detail, thinking about the, the, how star formation might actually work, uh, I have to think about this. IMF, hmm, I don't know. Uh, I'll punt on that if I may be allowed, which means it's a good question. I apologize. <laughs> um, should we go ahead with Gaspar first? Okay, okay thanks, uh, Thomas. Uh, thanks, Sandy, for this uh, wonderful talk. Um, I, ent I am entering to this domain uh, of uh, Stellar formation quenching. So it's very interesting to have seen this uh, excellent summary and with new ideas. Okay. So thanks. Uh, one of the, the, the questions I have uh, is uh, how those galaxies that uh, are basically already quench all the stellar formation, or in some of them are very violently, apparently, for example, some the of them are, are, galaxies. Some of them what? are what? This, some galaxies that has uh, quenched the stellar formation, or, or moreover, the, the stellar formation has been completely truncated. Yes, for example, yes. post Tarbos galaxies or ah. low of brightness galaxies, where yes. you see a very peculiar or almost a completely lack of stellar formation. How yes. these galaxies fit into these models you have presented now? Very interesting question. Another, I, sh I should have put that in outstanding questions. Yes, there's lots of evidence uh, to suggest that really there are sort of two tracks to quenching. And some people have called it the fast track versus the slow track. Now, the slow track, I think, fits large galaxies today, like the Milky Way and Andromeda, in which the central black hole mass is growing because sigma-1 is slowly growing. Why does sigma-1 grow? Nobody asked me that question. Um, presumably, I think the main thing is um, secular evolution in the disks of galaxies that slowly bring gas to the center where you build the black hole. Um, but that whole process is slow. Um, and the outcome is, seems to be that the bulge goes out first, not clear why that happens, but observationally seems to be true, leaving you with a ring of gas in the outer parts, which also slowly dies. And um, the whole process takes gig years, and you wind up with an S0. But in today's universe, and especially in early 
earlier times, um, it seems as though there was a faster process that took place, which might have involved galaxy merging. And it's more sudden, builds a black hole more suddenly, galaxy goes out more rapidly, and a much more rapid transition possibly from a disky star forming galaxy to a fluffy elliptical because of this, this merging process. So the paper discusses this, and I think many people have pointed out the fact that there are so-called blue nuggets at high redshift that are compact star forming objects. Their structure matches the so-called red nuggets, and it's believed that blue nuggets will quickly fade to become red nuggets. I would say, and other people have said, that those are on the fast track, and maybe they are triggered by mergers. But the key point is there seem to be a lot of them early, and their density in the universe today, I think, is much lower. Not, not zero, but much lower. So there's, if I were to guess, there is a gradual transition between fast track quenching early and slow track quenching late. And one of the things that we're involved in actually with a summer student right now um, is to see if we can see any evidence of that in Sloan spectra. And does it vary with mass? That's another interesting question. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And we're going to move to Boris. Boris. Um, hi, Sandy. Great talk. Um, I have a question myself, and that was also somewhat inspired by somebody in the Q&A. Um, a few years ago, we heard a lot about supernova feedback for switching off star formation. Is mm -hmm. th but you, you didn't even mention this. You, you completely um, concentrated on the black holes. Is supernova yeah. feedback dead? Or it's it's certainly especially, especially especially sorry especially in say low mass galaxies low mass mm. halos yeah so I think it's supernova supernova feedback is what I called winds okay okay Simply. and and so I think everybody would agree that supernova feedback is what is um, it's and its behavior with mass is that's what's laying down the stellar mass to halo mass relation. And it's the reason why halos are big, but stars are small in very little galaxies. They're dominated by dark matter. As time goes on, the potential wells deepen, the winds become less effective, and more of the infalling gas goes into stars. That's my understanding of why the stellar mass halo mass relation is as steep as it is. It has a slope of 1.75, which is pretty steep. So again, I, I don't have a theory for winds, but you will note in the slide that I showed, winds are strong in little galaxies. So now you might very well ask, well, does that mean they're completely unimportant in final quenching? I have assumed that they are. Uh, many hydrodynamic uh, simulations assume the same, but there was a paper recently about illustrious which compared the amount of quenching that's coming from supernova as opposed to AGN. And that paper said that in illustrious TNG, around 10 to the 10th solar masses, supernova are still important in final quenching, but by the time you get above 10.5 in the log, it was all due to AGN. So I think there's general agreement that uh, the role of supernovae are going down in quenching of more massive galaxies, but exactly where the zero points are between supernovae and AGN um, might depend on the actual model. Good question. Thank you. Paul is raising his hand. <laughs> yes, <clears throat> thanks for the very nice talk. So uh, my question is related to ultra diffuse galaxies. So in recent years, many people have uh, found UDGs in, in mainly clusters. And uh, so I wanted to know, so what's your idea on, or your interpretation of the formation scenario for these galaxies? Because you talk a lot about quenching. So we see that for a given stellar mass, right, they are much bigger. And so where are the, the stars? Where, where are they? So that's my question. That's a really good question. As you can see, the, the, the picture here isn't really geared to them at all. Um, it, I think it's most productive to think of this picture as as matching galaxies like um, the Milky Way, M33, even the Magellanic Clouds. But by the time we get to ultra diffuse galaxies, gosh, um, I certainly don't think this picture has much to, 
helpful to say about them. Yeah, and I, I can of course take refuge behind the fact that as you say, many of them are in clusters and the theory specifically doesn't apply to anything in a cluster except the central galaxy, which it should apply to. But all the satellites are on another page. Yeah, I mean, I guess the main question is, right, are they too, too large for a given stellar mass or are they, or they, they are too, as they, they have little, too little stars for a given uh, a, a radius size, yeah. right? So, that's that's, uh, so we don't question. know where they come from. Yeah. Nope. Uh-uh. I hear every talk I hear, I think maybe I have an idea and then I hear another talk and that idea is, is demolished and so I'm, I'm clueless. <laughs> Here's another Q&A question from Rodrigo Freitas. Um, what physical processes, conditions, in your opinion, would enhance the growth of the black hole mass in the green valleys in particular? Ah. Very good. Okay, so something, this, this allows me to expand a little bit. Uh, I didn't have time to, to really talk about this. So in the picture that I presented, you should really call it sort of phase one of the theory. And specifically what I'm getting at is the cartoon and the blue line in the cartoon. So the blue line in the cartoon is, um, sup is supposed to indicate the growth of a black hole as a function of sigma one during the star forming phase. Now, um, and then there's this rapid increase, maybe not rapid with time so much as rapid versus sigma one, okay? That's the, the change in slope. First of all, why do we think that there might be any change at all? And that is coming actually seen in, in three or four different kinds of hydro models with different causes, but they all sort of boil down to the fact that in the early phases of, of star formation, the central density of the galaxy is low. The potential well is ill-defined. There are a lot of, there's a lot of gas in the middle. There's a lot of supernova going off. The, as people put this condition into their black hole accretion model, black holes only accrete slowly. And they really accrete slowly. Like for example, um, the galaxy could go from a mass of say <clears throat> 10 to the eighth to 10 to the 10th and the black hole in the model would only increase by a mass of three. So in these hydrodynamic models I'm referring to, the black holes are, the central black holes are kind of frozen until something changes. And various authors describe it in different ways, but I think it's probably easy to sum up by saying that secular evolution is happening. It's bringing mass to the center. That mass is forming stars. SD1 is increasing. Sigma is increasing. The potential well is deepening. And there's a magic velocity for the efficacy of supernova feedback. It was pointed out by Deckel and Silk back in 1986. When the characteristic potential well has a depth of 100 kilometers a second or so, supernova winds have a hard time evacuating it. And so this um, takeoff in the central black hole growth is, uh, occurs when the central potential gets to the point where the black hole turns on. And you can see this in the trajectories of these hydrodynamic models. There's nothing happening for a while and then boom, okay? Uh, and that's, that slope in, in, in time or versus galaxy mass, sometimes it's plotted that way, is very steep. And so what seems to be happening in these models is the black hole takes off, it kills the local star formation in, in a bulge, and now we have this paradoxical situation that uh, that some little dribbles can get back into the black hole and keep it alive. So if I were, that's a long-winded answer to that question, but if I were to sum up, I would say that the gradual deepening of the central potential well is nullifying supernova feedback and unleashing the black hole. And here I'm quoting um, Avishai Dekel, who uh, brought these ideas to my attention. Okay, I think we should uh, wrap up here. Um, 
Patricio is uh, at the limit, I can see <laughs> our translator. So, <laughs> right, he must be exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> Thank so, you, Patricio. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much, Sandy. This was a wonderful talk, wonderful discussion. Thank you for presenting us your work. We well, um, I'm very honored and um, I'm looking forward to helping you put this online with my summary slides up front so that people can decide whether they want to listen to this talk in full. And thank you all. This has been a wonderful experience for me. Great. Thank you so much. So all the talks of this series will be um, on the YouTube channel at some point, and uh, both English and Spanish, and we will provide a high resolution version um, of the live stream. Um, so we would uh, like to let everyone know that due to scheduling issues that we had, uh, the time of our talk on Friday with uh, Professor Didier Kellos has been moved from 10.30 to 10 .5, sorry, 11.15, Chilean standard time. Uh, we have updated the timing uh, on the webinar web pages and also within Zoom. So if you registered already for the talk, you should have received a notification in your email. Uh, we would like to welcome everyone back tomorrow for the fourth talk of this series, which is going to be given by Stephen Wolfram, who will be telling us about his new fundamental theory of physics and its implications for astrophysics and cosmology. Wonderful. Thank you again all. Uh, so remember to register in advance for each talk so you can join us here on Zoom and you can ask questions and answers. We will be streaming live on YouTube as well, but we're un unfortunately unable to monitor the questions there so we can't ask those. So that's it. Uh, there's nothing left to say except thank you to everyone, to Sandy, to our panelists, to all our attendees, and see you all tomorrow. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you.